with our next speaker, Nusrat Chaudhry, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Amherst College. We turn to, Bangla to Bangladesh and the problematic of political communication. Her topic for today is Bridging Bangladesh, Populist Projects and the Dreamwork of Development. Join me in welcoming Nusrat. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here on uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, thank you, the organizers, and thanks, Thangam, for bringing up superstition, and you will see why. <laughs> so I'd like to start by sharing with you three scenes. I also don't have any show and tell, so I thank you in advance for your attention. <clears throat> the first takes place at the site of the longest river bridge in Bangladesh. Featuring a pile depth of 390 feet, it is also the deepest in the world. It spans the Podda, which is about 75 miles long and about five miles at its widest. Officially known as the Podda Multipurpose Bridge Project and popularly known as Podda Shetu, it was inaugurated in June 2022, years after the anticipated date of completion and way over the projected cost by more than a billion dollars. The ever receding finish line has made it difficult to specify construction cost and time, but that is also a part of this story. One of the few mighty rivers that come down from the Himalayas and flow into the Bay of Bengal, the Podda, a tributary of the Ganges, cuts the country into half. This is a long-standing inconvenience that the bridge aims to redress. It will resolve the problem of connecting the north and the capital Dhaka to the southwest, which otherwise made for a strenuous trip involving buses and ferries that could take up a whole day. The bridge will shed a good few hours from the trek. In addition to connecting 21 districts in the south, it will also connect Bangladesh to India, China, Myanmar, and Bhutan by establishing links to regional blocks and corridors for smoother access to global markets. Metaphorically, the bridge already speaks volumes. It spectacularly performs a well-worn script of post-colonial development, championed most forcefully by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, for whom the bridge, has, the bridge has been a dream, a recurrent motive that popularized the epithet Shopner Shetu, the Bridge of Dreams. Its monumentality offers the perfect visual for Bangladesh's graduation to developing status, recommended by the UN Committee for Development Policy in March 2021, in the 50th year of independence. In her speech at the inauguration on June 25th, the Prime Minister declared, I quote, this bridge is not just bricks, cement, iron, and concrete. This bridge is our pride, a symbol of our capacity, our strength, and our dignity. Beyond the patriotic affect that the PM's comment presupposed and entailed, Podda Shetu has been the object of extraordinary affective investment that spilled over any official rhetoric. Perhaps the most popular tourist destination in the country since its inauguration in June this year, and some might even argue even before then, a set of disparate events that took place within hours of the bridge being open to the general public offer a glimpse into this particular fetish, and I use fetish very advisedly here. For example, two young men died from a traffic accident as they were racing each other on their motorbikes on the bridge. One man was seen on his knees praying in the middle of the bridge, Another was photographed relieving himself from its edge. Bayezi, the young man from the capital, released a TikTok video of, of himself unscrewing nuts and bolts from the concrete structure using just the toolbox of his motorbike. And a convicted criminal serving life sentence who was at large for a couple of years was arrested near the bridge and made news headlines as the first prisoner of the new police thana that has been set up near the bridge. Clearly, this is no banal infrastructure like pipes, water meters, or exposed electric wires to which anthropologists have been attentive of late. A deliberate act of spectacular engineering designed to enthrall as well as to connect, the Podda Bridge indexes a true aesthetic of arrival, a concrete structure that is also a structure of feeling. For the second scene, let us go back a decade. The bridge in Bangladesh found itself at the center of a global scandal. World Bank, the main donor organization that was to foot the expense, decided to withdraw the $1.2 billion that it had promised Bangladesh. It came to the decision after discovering a corruption scheme involving multiple countries. In 2011, the World Bank's integrity vice presidency learned that a couple of employees of SNC-Lavala, a Quebec-based engineering firm, 
and a Bangladeshi Canadian citizen were planning to bribe government officials in Bangladesh to get the $50 million contract to build the bridge. The government of Bangladesh categorically denied the charges and refused the bank's conditions for funding, which asked for the temporary removal of a few key public officials suspected of involvement and the appointment of a special inquiry team, among others. At the end, the bank claimed to have no choice but to withdraw completely. In response, the Bangladeshi Prime Minister vowed to build the bridge without foreign help. To completely disengage was a rare move in part of the World Bank, especially since it has recently deemed Bangladesh an emergent hotspot where climate threat and actions meet. Inside the country, the decision led to some house cleaning at the highest level, while it sparked conversations on corruption, development, and donor responsibility far beyond. People around the globe chimed in both for and against the bank's move to renege on its commitment to support infrastructure in the global south. The Supreme Court of Canada, in the meantime, dismissed the case against the former vice president of SNC-Lavala, along with two other defendants. Following the verdict, Kevin Wallace's lawyer, who was the former vice president, said that it was because there was no evidentiary basis other than, quote, speculation, conjecture, and guesswork for the wiretap that was sought in this case. Superior Court Justice Ian Nordheimer rebuked the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, saying, reduced to its essentials, the information provided in the wiretap applications was nothing more than speculation, gossip, and rumor. For the third and final scene, we fast forward to 2019, a good six years since the corruption charges were dropped by the Canadian court because of the nature of the evidence submitted during trial. This time, Podda Shetu became the center of a different set of exchanges. In July, in July 2019, separate crowds in Bangladesh publicly lynched eight people within five days in suspicion of kidnapping children. Groups of ordinary citizens attacked individuals near or on school campuses in different parts of the country some hundreds of miles away from the river. The mob violence was spurred by a short-lived, if highly standardized and consequential rumor that the bridge required children's heads for completion by 2020. The collective violence done, and by, done by and against mostly working class citizens, though striking in their current articulation and scope, is not all that uncommon in South Asia. This form of public assembly around marginal figures of criminality are also culturally familiar techniques of surveillance and justice. If ethnographic evidence is anything to go by, they have been documented in various forms across Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. In Bangladesh, the voices in the public sphere that aim to look beyond the usual condemnation find a familiar rubric of disenfranchisement to explain the violence. These days, as in other places, the rumor and the spectacle of punishment make use of the widely available and relatively affordable means of virtual dissemination, most commonly Facebook and WhatsApp. Against this background, and for the purposes of this paper, I ask a couple of broad questions. How do rumors, a set of utterances without clear authorship or audience, connect the local, national, and global contexts within which the Podda Bridge emerges at once as an ideal and a scandal? And what do their entanglements and afterlives reveal about the unfolding relationship between people, nature, and populist projects? Populist projects, or what I call infrastructural populism, is a form of developmentalist impetus that thrives on mass appeal, and through a careful management of affect, purports to unite the people in pride and awe, despite all costs and fiscal misspending it may otherwise accrue. I propose that while infrastructural populism thrives on and energizes visibilities, the system of language is often seen as a supplement to the visual. The events described above are just to rethink this relationship in order to privilege orality as much as visibility as constitutive of the connections that the bridge made apparent. I argue that a close look into the workings of language in the form of rumor, hearsay, and official rhetoric points to the ways in which people and nature both come to haunt the pod project of infrastructural populism. So section one. In 1930, nearly a century before Podda Bij was a reality, Kazi Nozrul Islam, the Bengali poet, published a one-act play called Shetu Bandho, or The Bridge. 
Drawing heavily on Hindu mythological tropes and figures, which Nozrul has done masterfully throughout his career, Shetubandhu is a story of good versus evil that laminates loosely on a narrative of machine against nature. Here it's machine god Jantraputi, who's preparing to build a bridge over the river Podda, thus antagonizing Podda Devi, the river goddess. Jantraputi's foot soldiers are brick, wood, stone, iron, machine, machine worker, beasts of burden, and load-carrying humans. On the side of the Podda are rain, waves, fish, storm, lightning, floods, and so forth. In this epic battle, the king of the clouds is summoned by the river to fight the machine god's conspiracy to domesticate the river, their entry into the heavens. At the end of the third scene, to cut the story short, the power of machine must accept defeat in the hands of nature, while the river Podda addresses the machine god, saying, I know you will come back again and again, and yet each time you shall have to return with the fatal blow of humiliation, Lanchona. Postcolonial dreams of arrival are often technopolitical. Progress needs concrete reminders in literal and figurative senses. Bangladesh is no exception, though it does provide us with a somewhat unique point of departure. Deemed as the ground zero of climate crisis, development in recent years is imagined as more anticipatory and adaptive. Still, from birth control and microcredit targeting rural women to encouraging shrimp cultivation in the coastal areas, climate change adaptations coexist with policies that are by now more than a half century old. Even in 1982, an article in an architecture journal comparing Dhaka to Baghdad noted, how political regimes in Bangladesh have favored Western architectural models, including the necessary technology, expertise, and material, even when those were at variance with local economic and political realities. The writer here was, of course, speaking on the famous assembly building designed by Louis Kahn. Not much has changed since when it comes to creating grandiose landmarks of political, social, and technological progress at whatever cost. The adaptive policies are applied to the areas considered most vulnerable to the rise of sea level, due mostly to a steady funneling of international funds to tackle climate change, but they hide deep-rooted tendencies in sidelining systemic issues in favor of technical responses to simplistic crisis narratives. Bangladesh then emerges as a frontier in two very different but related senses from a planetary perspective because of what is largely seen as unavoidable ecological crisis and as an emergent site of investment. The country recently got its first sovereign debt rating by the big three credit rating agencies. It has also been included among JP Morgan's Frontier Five and Goldman Sachs Net 11. To quote a young finance professional in Dhaka, Bangladesh is an entrepreneur's wet dream. There are problems left, right, and center everywhere you look and that is what entrepreneurs thrive on. Even when donor funding comprises only three to 4% of the total national budget, international legitimation remains vital. And that is why a mishap of global proportions, which was the Podda Bridge corruption scandal, has been particularly difficult to swallow for a country known as an aid lab in the world of development. Bangladesh has been a powerful aid justifying idea partly because of its dismal beginning, which made any success entirely unlikely. But the idea of Bangladesh is so powerful in the 21st century is precisely because its successes, Naomi Hossein claims, satisfy both the soft-hearted liberal and the die-hard neoliberal. Still, corruption has been a permanent scourge, a cultural disease that only afflicts certain places and people. Consider the Podda Shetu case once more. While the World Bank lost the criminal case due to the nature of the evidence, it still managed to get a verdict that upheld its status as an international organization that enjoyed immunity against the compulsory production of documents in criminal cases. The decision recognized that the World Bank, along with other multilateral development banks, through their investigations, serves at the front line of international anti-corruption efforts. In the official letter that the World Bank issued announcing its withdrawal from the Podda Bridge project, it did not mince words. I quote, the World Bank cannot, should not, and will not turn a blind eye to evidence of corruption. Of course, the admission of the wiretap evidence and the bank's privilege to not comply in submitting documents did not absolve SNC Lavala of bribery allegations. In fact, the company has been serving a ban imposed in 2013 that prohibits it from bidding on any development projects financed by the World Bank for 10 years. 
Clearly, if the bank came out of the scandal unscathed, the same could not be said of SNC-Lavalin. And yet, the company has remained mostly beyond reproach, despite being embroiled in multiple charges of corruption in a number of countries for years. Its success in avoiding punishment has sparked debates over the alleged political interference in Canada's justing system. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's electoral campaign was also marred by the involvement of SNC-Lavalin. The problem of evidence, particularly in the form of hearsay, afflicted the case in more direct ways. Judge Nordheimer pointed this out. Nothing that could fairly be referred to as direct factual evidence to support the rumor and speculation was provided or investigated. Finally, dismissing all World Bank allegations as false rumor, the Bangladeshi government had to perform its own sacrifices. By 2012, the project director and the secretary of the communication ministry were sent home. Soon, the minister himself was asked to resign. A senior Bangladeshi journalist wrote in 2012, I quote, ideally politicians blame it on their opponents, but the Podda Bridge is a difficult situation. It is like a revolution that's devouring its own children. The government has to sacrifice its best men to satisfy a recalcitrant international body which refuses to negotiate on its list of corruption suspects. A bunch of people apparently tried to sacrifice the interest of building a bridge to make some money. The bridge in its turn is seeking revenge, asking for the sacrifice of everyone involved. Section two. That was 2012. By the time 2019 came, sacrifice was no mere metaphor. It started with an incident in July 2019 in the northeast of the country, when a young man was allegedly caught carrying a bag with a child's severed head in it. He was killed in mob beating, but the words about his culpability spread far and wide. The bridge wants blood was one of the captions in a photo collage that was shared along with the rumor on Facebook the same year. Since then, Cheledhara, child kidnapper, or Kollakata, one who severs heads, became for some time a dreaded figure that needed to be excised from the social. As I said before, eight people were killed within five days in July of 2019. Vigilante violence functions on a concept of legitimacy that emerges at the moment of encounter with the child kidnapper, who is considered a mediator, so to speak, between the bridge and its victims. The word for rumor in Bangla is gujob. It carries almost the same meaning as rumor does in English. Despite its semantic equivalence with English, gujob has taken on a heterogeneous set of resonances in recent years. What is now officially called rumor is what some scholars have called public secrets. They are what is generally known, but for one reason or another cannot be easily said or said without consequence. Any utterance that can possibly tarnish the image of the regime is either fake news or rumor and due target of state censorship. Wary of using an authorial voice, the circulation of oppositional ideas then by necessity take on the aura of unsubstantiated knowledge, their networks of circulation becoming more and more informal thereby proximate to what Vinadas has named the region of rumor. There has been an official effort to put the Podda Bridge rumors into the same category as those that are critical of the government and thereby manage them. Two explanatory frameworks have emerged. State officials, law and order, and sometimes the press, depending on their political leaning, label them as conspiracy. This was a smear campaign an evil-minded group has been actively diminishing the accomplishment of the present government by trying to detail, derail a robust and relentless narrative of success. What better way to do this other than scandalizing the bridge, the dream project of the prime minister? This unsurprisingly did not catch on. Mobs, familiar though they are, are difficult entities, easy to criminalize, almost impossible to name, and notoriously elusive when it comes to the law. The riotousness and impertinence of unruly collectives have preoccupied thinkers of democracy and peoplehood spanning centuries. The nationalist crowd may inspire awe, but the mob hovers nearby as its dark, illiberal, intractable shadow. It brings into crisis the progressive faith in popular sovereignty. Heeding the pressure of the street, as Habermas would say, is neither a South Asian problem nor a novel democratic anxiety. For many local commentators, however, the mob attacks in Bangladesh were articulations of the voices of the poor, where poor stands mostly for uneducated, gullible, superstitious, and cruel. 
Take this representative sentiment published in an English daily, which carried the gist of the informal conversations I had with people in the months that followed. An op-ed writer who had heard three separate accounts of the same rumor that sounded like what she called a Gaulish ancient legend confessed that they were related to her by her cook and domestic workers. Simple folk, she called them. Social media, and I quote, undeniably has added a dangerous dimension to such mob mentality as more and more people have access to smartphones and internet and yet cannot differentiate between truth and fake news, end of quote. She went on to add, so are most people bloodthirsty creatures who just want to lash out their frustration on an individual who they think deserve to die? If so, why does this not happen in other countries? In addition to the suspect ideological underpinning, the article also rehashes common myths about this and other lynchings. For one, the Chilidhara rumors were not restricted to a more digitally active urban or semi-urban context. It had reached remote areas where people heard them from hanging out at the local market, from their neighbors, and from the parents of other children of school, at school. Facebook and WhatsApp may have been efficient vectors, but they were clearly not the only ones. There's also deep historical and cultural myopia in thinking of mob violence as a strictly Bangladeshi or even a South Asian phenomenon. Racialized lynching is but one chapter in the violent history of the United States. And ethnographers have found rumors with more longevity and consequent violence around, among other things, organ theft, genital theft, the sacrifice of children, women, or pregnant women for the success of construction projects from Brazil to Ghana, from Johannesburg to Jakarta. And to speak more specifically about the perils of building bridges, both James Joyce and Rudyard Kipling have written short stories about the work of evil, be it the devil or other malevolent deities, before and after the publication of Nusrul's Shetu Bandho in 1930. So let me offer a particular instantiation of this rumor, and I'm going to talk about a particular case, which may seem like a digression, but it is actually kind of important to understand the form um, that this violin took, violence took. So this rumor-related death created the most stir in the Bangladeshi public sphere, which had to do with the victim's gender, the fact that the incident took place in the middle of the capital city, and that she was at least aspirationally middle class. So Toslima Begum Renu was a 40-year-old single mother of two who was seen standing in front of a public school in Dhaka on July 21st, 2019. She was wearing a black burqa that covered the long tunic she had on underneath, which was different from the more common hijab that would only cover her head. The burqa was mentioned in passing in both police and post-mortem reports. This is important because the burqa, and therefore the hidden aspect of her appearance, did not seem to cause suspicion and did not make it to the many descriptions of the incident I read in the press and in the eyewitness statements included in the case docket. Renu, as she is commonly written about in the press, was at the gate of the school when a group of parents, mothers to be precise, asked her why she was there. She said she had come to get admission forms for her children. Her answer was the first cause of suspicion. Bengali medium public schools ordinarily started in January, not July. To be certain that her intentions were authentic, they asked for her address. At this point, Toslima Begum faltered. She named one area only to change her answer when asked the second time. As more suspicion ensued, the parents decided to escort her to the office of the headmistress of the school. There too, she was asked the same questions. Seeing her hesitate to speak, the headmistress gave her a piece of paper to write down her address. In the meantime, according to witness reports, four to 500 people gathered at the school gate. One of the parents, the mother of a child in first grade, told the fruit seller and the shopkeeper nearby that she must be a child kidnapper. Both Chelidhara and Kollakata were used to describe a woman whose inability to speak or speak clearly made those around her confident in naming her as such. The crowd smashed the lock of the collapsible gate and entered the school campus. Seeing that the situation was getting out of hand, the school authorities used the loudspeaker to ask people to disperse, assuring them that she was not a kidnapper, but only a parent. Oblivious to the voice coming from above, a large crowd dragged her from the office, brought her to the open area near the school gate, and started beating her up. One of the parents was also heard egging the crowd on by calling her a kidnapper and putting in a few blows in herself. This was mentioned in the witness accounts and the video footage recorded on mobile phones by many on site. 
Toslima Begum's nephew, who filed the first information report, found about her, his aunt's death from a Facebook post and rushed to the hospital where he identified the body. A few details from this tragedy stand out. Toslima Begum's inability to defend herself in and through language was both a source of suspicion as well as its evidence. In the FIR, her nephew mentions that his aunt has had mental health problems in the past, which may or may not have caused an impediment to her speech or her general ability to defend herself verbally that led to the violence. The police filed a case against four to 500 unnamed people who participated in the violence with the intention to murder. Mm -hmm. By September 2020, they filed a charge sheet against only 15. This included two minors and a mother of a student at the school who had alerted others that there was a child kidnapper in their midst. It's evident that gonopituni, which is the Bangla word for mob beating, is a form of surveillance, but its system is one of language rather than one reliant on visibilities evident in more state-sponsored or privatized forms of security and policing that are fast becoming a part of everyday urban life in Bangladesh. Indeed, one of the recommendations that were made by the police after the vigilante deaths along with more community-based approaches to dispel rumors such as street theater and mosque announcements, was to install closed-circuit cameras in and around school campuses. Similar violent unfolding around language has also been observed by anthropologist Jim Siegel, who argues that in Solo Indonesia, his field site, the beating of the thief is itself a kind of language. The thief, like a chiledhara, is variously defined as an outsider, but it is the naming that confirms his or her identity. Naming the thief follows immediately by a punch. Joshua Barker, following Siegel and based on his own research in Bandung, writes, the thief is subjected to the word punch. The elimination of the thief, he adds, is performed not for the eye of the ruler, nor in front of an identifying or cynical public, but by the public itself. Each person gets his or her kick in and peers at the results. In the case of Toslima Begum and others, I suspect something similar is at work. Here, the operative logic is not commercialized surveillance or a visibility mediated by the gaze of those in power. Legitimacy here does not derive from an outside authority, but is an evidence of force which is performed in the encounter with the Chiladhara. It's important to note that much of this became front page news because the speed at which the visual material made rounds on social media. The fact that Toslima Begum's family members found out about her death from the moving images circulated by those present in the crowd is tragic, but perhaps not surprising. It shifts our focus to the everyday entanglements of mobs and mediation, which seems counterintuitive at first. In the mob, the sovereign right to punish is seemingly decoupled from mediating institutions like courts and prisons. Premised on an intuitive sense of right, mob justice can therefore be seen as a supplement to the state, a form of direct intervention. And yet, the details of mob violence compel us to consider the various modalities of mediation at work. I do not suggest that watching or witnessing has not been significant. What is missing from the available frameworks of analysis is language, which I believe has been central to the encounter. This line of reasoning goes against the received wisdom about mobs as merely impulsive, immediate, and affective. Taking this form of mediation into account also challenges a divide that has informed theorization about the so-called corporeality of crowds or mobs versus the communicative rationality of publics. While a public is constituted through addressability and deliberation, mobs are supposedly the visceral, unmediated, irrational agents of politics. I argue that paying attention to language or the victim's inability to perform proper subjectivity through language also helps us challenge theoretical assumptions about the linguistic mediations of crowds, mobs, and publics. And this is also why I believe what Taslima Begum Renu was wearing is relevant. She was a new face, to be sure, but it was her incoherent language that became the source of suspicion and led to her naming as a Chelidhara. She was unable to perform the script of proper or acceptable personhood. The child kidnapper, one must note, is not a recognizable type. The fact that his or her appearance reveals nothing except the ordinary in part explains some of the cruelty and excess of the violence. Following Irving Goffman's concept of interactional dysphoria, which is a sort of interactional misstep, 
Julien Bonhomme argues that mob violence triggered by rumors occurs when an individual does not demonstrate the interactional engagement expected of him or her. The tragedy of Toslima Begum is a case in point. Without offering a normative critique of the events in question or falling back on an atavistic framework of folklore, I've tried to understand the power of linguistic communication to mediate violence, a relationship that connects the body of Toslima Begum to the Podda Bridge and beyond. This, I believe, is more of an opening up than a tidy ending to the messy and volatile nature of the communicative politics that Podda Shetu has brought to our attention. The building of the bridge itself aims to challenge stale images of Bangladesh as a poor, donor-dependent Malthusia, as opposed to an up-and-coming foreign investment hotspot with a newly minted developing status. And yet the lynchings based on the rumor for its need for blood have surely evidenced for many citizens and outsiders alike the underdevelopment of Bangladesh's most abundant resource, its people. In South Asia, this problematic of the people goes back to the moment of post-colonial founding, if not earlier. The temporality of development, its progress through time, and the telos of independence have long vexed anti-colonial and nationalist thinkers for whom many of their fellow women and men were grievously unprepared for self-rule. They were not quite, not yet, the people. Indeed, what concept of the people was congruent with the time of development had been one of the core problems in democratic nation building across the newly decolonized world. If anything, the Podda Bridge events remind us that the developmental conception of the globe continues to exert a moral authority, even though popular political actions have routinely punctuated the time of development. So to end, let's come back to Podda Shetu. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's inaugural speech made ample references to various iterations of the people, namely Deshbashi, Jonogon, and Manush, to name a few. None of them, however, is as politically resonant as Jonuta, which is a widely used translation of the mob. This is the Jonuta that defied official pronouncements and took over the bridge long before it was supposed to welcome ordinary citizens. The ensuing chaos, some of which I mentioned earlier in the paper, prompted new laws criminalizing driving motorbikes, peeing and spitting, making social media videos on the bridge, and stopping and stepping out of your vehicle at any point to take photographs. While praising the people of Bangladesh for being uncompromising and the source of her strength, Hasina also describes the Podda itself as Khorosrota, a river with strong tides unpredictable, and she emphasized the word in English in an otherwise Bangla speech, and onomonio, intransigent. As images of the people climbing the bridge despite official restrictions, and ordinary citizens taking apart the bridge of dreams, literally, one bolt at a time made the rounds, it was evident that both nature and the people, or at least a version of it, perhaps because of its proximity to nature, needed to be domesticated, that is, ruled or regulated. Yet the fetish of the bridge and its seemingly illiberal, violent, and anachronistic local resonances are also the right fodder for national and international communities to brandish the twin talismans of development and democracy. Both seem tragically wanting in the cases at hand. To chart the global careers of both democracy and development, and to better understand the natural world that fundamentally shapes them, we must listen more carefully to what the people are saying, even in the cruelest of encounters. I actually have a really quick question. Do you know if you see this this kind of a phenomenon that you described in other structures that other, have been sorry, in other structures, structures and either in Bangladesh or like in the broader area of South Asia? Yeah, um, Jonathan Perry, the anthropologist, has written quite extensively about a steel town in Jharkhand, India, where similar kind of uh, rumors uh, about um, you know the plant itself needing, you know, human blood and things like that um, uh, have circulated for a very long time. Um, and there are obviously folkloric discussions in the sense that discussions in the register of folklore where people talk a lot about particular uh, pawns, dighis, um, you know, that uh, a jomidar, for example, would want to, you know, dig and there's no water coming up and you would have to sacrifice something. In fact, Kornofuli, the river that runs uh, in the south of uh, Bangladesh in Chittagong and Chittagong Hill Tracts, 
um, actually gets its name from a folklore where um, the earring of uh, a young woman had to be, you know, uh, she lost her earring in the river and there was this kind of trope of sacrifice. So I think rivers are, I mean, bodies of water uh, have, it seemed like have been particularly fertile kind of sites of, of these kinds of narratives. But, you know, something like that happening so close to the capital city in 2019 has created a lot of uproar and precisely because the bridge itself occupies, you know, the national imagination in a very particular way that this, um, that this kind of narrative or a set of rumors actually um, made people think that this was very new. Uh, but again, people who are even trying to look at the deeper history of it often fall back on this kind of folkloric, you know, um, framework, which is something I was trying to avoid. Yeah. I think we had one more question. Uh, oh, there. Yeah. Uh, I think it's related to what you just said at the end. I was interested in what you mentioned about uh, the crowd being linguistically mediated um, and in understanding it as a form of interactional dysphoria. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering what you're pushing against. Yeah. Is it just the liberal perception of the middle class or, or is it like a specific strand of analytic work that you're... Yeah, thank you. I mean, the liberal perception of the middle class, it's, no, I mean, yes, it's so easy to deconstruct that it's not even worth doing it to a certain extent. I think I, think I was doing this at a more analytical level because even a lot of critique of Habermas's work, for example, as, as important and astute as they are, um, kind of end up uh, reproducing this, uh, this kind of distinction between crowds as being unmediated and you know, the public uh, or the people uh, as kind of mediated through language. You know, the crowd doesn't have, the mob doesn't have language. It only has this kind of affective relationship to whatever it's attacking, right? But what I was, what I noticed was that there is actually a lot of um, kind of um, discussion happening, right? I mean, obviously, you know, touching somebody, beating somebody, that's a very physical um, kind of encounter, but a lot of it was premised on how this person was named, what kind of discourse uh, that event itself generated, right? And I feel like, a lot of times when we think about crowd violence or mobs or vigilantism, that focus on language um, gets sidelined. So I'm not saying that visibility is not important, and especially when you're talking about populist infrastructure, that's all that there is, it's visibility, right? And in fact, many people in Bangladesh will now tell you now that the bridge is there, nobody wants to talk about those things. It's also about visibility that it's there, you know, this concrete structure. Um, but I don't think you, you get um, the kind of complexity of a particular encounter by just focusing on the visibility. And it also happens precisely because of the way in which a lot of these images circulate. Um, they're, they're, they, they circulate as images, um, but it's only when you look very closely you see that language was actually very formative of the encounter itself. Okay, well thank you very much. Let's, um, I think we're going to move fairly quickly to, um, I guess I should introduce you, um, Rosalind Morris, um, professor of anthropology here at Columbia, um, will be our first discussant, uh, and then um, will be followed by um, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, who, as I've mentioned, is a university professor here also at Columbia, founder of um, uh, whatever you call it. <laughs> <laughs> founder of the Institute for Comparative Literature you. and Society. Sorry, I just drew a blank. Sorry, I introduced myself before. <laughs> Go ahead, Ross. Take me off okay. the center stage well, here. I know that we are uh, short of time, and I will be very brief, but I will begin by thanking the presenters for three extremely elegant, intelligent, challenging, and um, engaging papers. Um, it's rare these days to be in a room where people are so devoted to reading, and this is a, this is a relief and a pleasure. Um, 
I'm going to work in reverse order because these are, this is the first time I've encountered these papers. I have not produced a synthetic art. Um, I do have some questions, though, that I think um, arise from the relationship, uh, the resonances between these um, papers. And I want to start with the uh, Nusrat with your last uh, response to the question about the sacrificial offering, to which you offered the the kind of history, the deep history of such. Um, offerings or relations, obligations to the river. And one would want to maybe supplement that with the well-documented history of the demand for sacrifices to industrial capitalist production facilities in South Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, which are the stuff of much anthropological literature. And we could adduce this as history or we could adduce it as folklore, but it seems to me that what your um, paper and indeed the other papers ask us to consider is um, how to read that gesture and how to take seriously that gesture as precisely a figuration of what capital is, does, and demands, namely the sacrifice of, 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 of blood, the, the sacrifice of flesh, the sacrifice of labor time and power and so forth. I'm not saying that that would be a sufficient way to respond to that, but I am saying that one might ask of these figures, what is their truth? Um, and not merely what is their status in those, in those um, you know, tr disciplinary traditions of folklore, anthropological or ethno-history and so forth. So you gave us this description of a space in which, um, on the one hand, I think was the original formulation, on the one hand, Bangladesh is the aid lab, the eternally um, uh, underdeveloped, space to which aid uh, goes to experiment with its techniques of, of technical po political management. And on the other hand, the, the space of an entrepreneurial fantasy, investment, finance, capital, and so forth. And obviously what you're telling us is that the one has become the other in this moment, mm -hmm. that precisely the most vulnerable, the most destituted spaces mm -hmm. are those that are becoming um, refigured as sites of possible uh, uh, profit, mm -hmm. extractive capital, and so forth. And that seems to me um, a good reminder. Uh, I think you know the language of carbon futures or so forth some, sometimes displaces that other recognition. But what I learned most from you was that, um, that there is an enormous din discontinuity between the ways in which narrative functions in the juridical domain and the literary domain despite the fact that narrative functions in both, mm -hmm. has reality effects in both, but that something about the literary or the fictive, um, we might want to say demands of readers uh, a, a capacity to read for metaphoricity. And that, that, um, and that also that something about the literary offers an implicit instruction in that capacity to read for metaphoricity, something which is short-circuited in certain contexts, the mob context, the social mediatic context, that may indeed incite or enable um, forms of violence that are mimetic and no longer figuring themselves uh, as mimetic of state violence. But that, so I, I, that question of um, the discontinuity between those domains uh, which sometimes gets forgotten when people say, oh, the, the, the realm of the juridical is the realm of narrative and all we need to do is to read those narratives and we will understand the relationship between the two. I think the discontinuity is, is, is made uh, palpable in your account. But if, we can, if I can you know, use that as a seg segue to return to Tangham's uh, beautiful paper, and I found myself, as, as you concluded with reference to your hallucinatory readings, wishing that we could have heard more of your readings than Amitav Ghosh's, because I somehow feel like they are better. Yes. Why do I say that? <laughs> Why do I say that? Um, because I think we start, you, you made it clear that we start off with a question that Amitav Ghosh never asks, which is, what is the form of appearance of climate change or climate crisis that makes one able to say such a thing as a novel does or does not? have an account of climate change or climate crisis. And maybe everyone else in the room did exactly the same thing that I did when I heard that statement and immediately thought of you know, everything from 
you know, from Wordsworth's lyrics on through Moby Dick to to Heart of Darkness to Loretta and Clovis and They Didn't Die and thought these are all novels that might be might be coded not as novels about a thematized climate crisis, but novels in which that which is implicated in the production of a climate crisis can be read. And then the task becomes how to think the link between those forms of practice and forms of capital that are originary of the climate crisis, how they appear and are addressed, thought, imagined in these texts. And um, by the time that one gets to the point where the thematized object of the novel is climate, climate crisis, we have perhaps lost the other imaginative task of thinking that relationship, um, you know, of thinking what Dickens describes, of thinking what, uh, you know, what, what one finds in the, the mad story of a whale and the obsessive, vengeful pursuit of a certain kind of fuel. Um, in any case, I'm very eager to read the readings that you produced and that you um, maybe too modestly deferred for us in the, uh, in the service of Amitav Ghosh. But I do think that that question of what is the form of appearance of climate change uh, uh, and everything that precedes, undergirds, underwrites, and overdetermines it is an interesting question for, for literature and might save us from novels that are overly thematized um, without uh, imagining both um, causality and its, its alternatives. The alternative, however, is a, um, this term has been circulating here and it's a, it's a term that I think has some risks. And uh, you sort of remember Raymond Williams' uh, uh, admonition that the alternative is often doing work where the oppositional should be at play. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, indeed, when you invoked, in a way that probably surprises a lot of people, you invoked Levi Strauss's virtuous primitivism, um, which is often forgot in the easier denunciations of him. When you invoke that virtuous primitivism, which is everywhere at the moment, in anthropology, in cultural studies. Other people know and have had, and every non-capitalist world has had better relations with the natural world than has the post 17th century capitalist West, which may be true, um, or, 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 or not. Um, that adducing of the alternative stops there without a recognition that one doesn't go through the necessary epistemic transformations to think or feel or orient oneself that way without absolutely world transforming consequences and entailments. And that epistemic transformational part is not addressed by the mere designation of the alternative, which I think is where the anthropological stays in that, that anthropological descriptive stays. Let me then move to the last um, set of comments, if I, if I may, about uh, uh, Nainika's uh, paper, um, which um, is maybe quite continuous with the previous questions. I was struck in your, um, your, your concluding remarks about these tales as tales that bring together disparate elements which also depend on the willingness to listen or hear the connections made therein. And um, that, I think, uh, Gayatri has already mentioned it and always reminds us of this demand to learn to listen rather than to provide the voices for um, a gesture that is invoked, I think, in different places by different writers that you mention. But I was so struck by the crooked cats as you describe them always appearing in a biographical genre. You spoke repeatedly about the biographies of these cats uh, as being somehow the results of of, uh, or the expressions, the symptoms of corrupting human action that leads them to behave in ways that then turns them back as enemies of the human. And was wondering what it means to think about the truth of that story 
rather than simply finding in it the story of bad human action, which of course is the case, or danger, which is also the case. What about the truth of the biographical gesture, which in insofar as it, um, you know, const if biography rather than the novel is the genre of a certain kind of capitalist formation that always wants to personify capital as the capitalist, and that then uses that as well to produce those kinds of subjects who imagine themselves as the agents uh, responsible for their own destiny and therefore not responsible for anyone else. I wondered whether you might want to kind of um, pose that question of the biographical genre as indeed, and maybe genre isn't the right word, the literary critics will know much better than me, I'm just completely, shamelessly walking in territory for which I have no expertise. Um, but it does seem to me that the, the, there is a risk in that as well of um, a kind of recursive complicity with that system that produces biography as the narrative in which we learn about the structures. And I leave that as a question for you about how we think of the truth of the narratives that we encounter in the world with other people um, on several levels. Uh, it seems that we've we, we are constantly looking to content and we are constantly looking to moral or virtual, a virtuous, um, I don't know, uh, axioms for that truth. Uh, maybe a formal truth is also of, of use. I will stop there. I've spoken too long. I, I'm sorry, and I hand it over to Gayatri. Nine minutes. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you all for your, for your beautiful patience. Um, uh, Thangam, come and open your uh, laptop, will ya? Because I've got something here that's just, it's yours, isn't it, the laptop here? Uh, no, it isn't. Whose is it? Whose is this laptop? It's oh. the UIT. It's the UIT. Techno technologist, where are you? Can you open it for me? It requires a pin. Because I want to, I wrote something this morning which I think would be good to read. I brought my, what you call it, little thingy, thinking that I would have time to write more, which I didn't. Are you here? Okay. See, this is mine. I, I want to access it. Ah, beautiful. And come, get me the, uh, whatchamacallit, the, um, you know, the whole screen. <laughs> yes, I want to access my USB. Come on. <laughs> Two minutes. There we go. Yeah. I don't show sure enough. Why? <laughs> Maybe while you're doing that, I'll just make have one little thought I had along the way that um, that the conversation about uh, or the discussion of superstition as something that um, opens up worlds that we don't recognize when we're thinking as rational agents, and then how we react to a practice of say blood sacrifice where we distance ourselves from that. We can recognize its depths in the, in the um, history of the river, but are, are, we're not willing to even engage the possibility of that at the time when, you know, I walk around engaging, you know, experiencing Suf, what I call Sufi moments, you know, ridiculous coincidences that seem to happen often and acknowledge sort of things that are analogous to, I think, what, what you're discussing. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there as mm -hmm. um, I think we, we find it impossible to think about the possibility that uh, there's anything to sacrificing children's heads. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's like, you know, we do it all the time. <laughs> Why not? If we're waiting for, um, yeah. uh, we need we need you need a mic though. Today, this morning. Uh, can take one from here. No, yeah, I guess not. Oh, there it is. 
Thank you. And I'm thinking um, from your comments, I'm thinking about Hungry Tide, Amitabha Koshi's uh, other novel, where um, all these histories are being intertwined, um, all the colonial histories, um, and the histories of how the cyclones came to be, um, are being intertwined with not only deep history, but also the beliefs of the people in, in the Sundarban area, particularly the, around the figure of Bono Devi, right? And so that speaks, and because, because those two uh, people like Pia and Kana, Kanai are just, uh, you know, myths and, uh, you know, superstitions. So I think, and, but that is the space of imagination for people who, are, who have lived with all this climate crisis. Sorry, Gajit is ready. Um, okay. uh, yeah, so anyway, okay. just my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Gayatri, uh, go ahead. I, can I take this out? Thank you. OK, um, sorry for all of this rigmarole. Uh, but um, uh, our task was to think about what the uh, the possible roles of the humanities and qualitative social sciences. The, and so I would say that my entire um, intellectual efforts uh, are focused on the distinction that I have learned, which is that uh, even the qualitative social sciences must make some kind of truth claim that is to say, some production of knowledge, whereas the humanities, philosophy, and literature are about the practice of learning, that the practice of learning. And this uh, is very much like what we, uh, we see in, the, um, uh, in the, uh, the cultures that are based on namic languages, that is to say languages that are written on the memory rather than on more cruder things like paper or, uh, or we generally call them illiterate, but actually finally the digital has caught up with them. Before that, their systematization over the centuries was through cruder items. Now, generally speaking, these namic languages are in fact uh, producive of, uh, productive of, sorry, productive of, um, of um, uh, possible, they can possibly produce social formations and cultural formations that are in fact more addicted to, infested by, contaminated by the practice of learning because you can't leave evidence. I'm not, this is not Plato's uh, uh, position against writing and so on. I did, after all, translate that huge book by Derrida. This is, I can't take the time to talk about it now. The reason why I'm bringing this in, so the humanities, to an extent, learns from this. I uh, ask my students not to take notes because I want to see how, I, I'm not a good teacher, but how much I have been able to teach so that they uh, retain something the next day, almost nothing. Because I don't want to say, Spivak said, Spivak said, you know, and some and people even say, it will be helpful for me to hear your reading. No, I'm not selling my reading. So in, to that extent, I would say, that we have to remember when we think about climate change that, the, that climate change is all over the world and the worst victims are quite often dependent upon naming languages. So that it, if, if we take it seriously, then we cannot think that this, is, this, will, this invites us to rethink the academy. So this is why I wanted to bring up, this is an enormous problem, especially for someone who is 80 years old. But everybody else in this room is younger than I am. So to an extent, I would say so that this is, 
this challenge is worth thinking about. No one is asking anybody to leave the academy. God knows the academy is leaving itself as it corporatizes. I mean, the, it, when all my, I'm in literature after all, and this is a brand name Research One University. So much is spent here. And when my students come into my class, they're reading mangas. I'm not against graphic stuff, but in order to be able to read li in a literary way so that you identify with what you're reading, you surrender rather than control, summarize, etc. You we have to rethink the academy. That's the first item, where we are. If we start from where we are and we think of how, in fact, the ones who share nothing of our privileges suffer much more with climate change, then I don't think we are going to address all of our efforts to ourselves being able to read deep history. Uh, there are ways in which we have to rethink if we are serious. This is my main, main problem. And th uh, then I would say that, you know, I was, I, I was so taken by the stories about the Indus because that's, I mean, I'm older than you are, so that's, the, that's when that's when the, you know, the World Bank uh, was trying to be a, for rural development, remember? And they were going by regions, it was the Indus Valley. It was not Pakistan and India. And also there were people like Paul Sweezy and so on, uh, Magdoff, they were on, in fact related to the World Bank, they left very soon. But you see, and that's when one thinks about what it feels like, we're talking about language, to think about the Shindu. You know, it's a mistake, it's a Greek mistake to call it Indus, right? It's, they took the, uh, took the big initial vowel, right. the initial consonant and put it in the end, right? right. And just as to call Native Americans Indians is a white mistake that is still, in fact, preserved. So this mistake made by that Macedonian boy, uh, Shindu, <laughs> which we call, which we call uh, Shindu wrongly, because it's Sindhu, isn't it? And, but when we think about the Sindhu in those days, what did we learn? Very young, politically committed people. And, it, and there was no understanding of climate change, and it had not become politically correct for smart capital. That's, the, that's another thing that we really have to fight as academics, you know, smart capital. I mean, you know, Nainika, my sister lives in Delhi. I talk to her twice a day. Um, uh, so NDTV just showed a huge thing on the Chita. And I have a feeling that this is what you're also talking about. So my sister is telling me all about, uh, you know, how fast they can move, etc., etc. You say, I didn't know these things about the Chita. So you're absolutely correct. And we've got to fight this one, as you said. You know, so I like that very much. And uh, I know I shouldn't talk too long. But I won't talk too long. You cut me off at nine minutes. But I do have to tell a story which is completely, I mean, I've made a, a huge point, uh, before, which nobody will do anything about, I know. But nonetheless, so now can I just tell a story? This is the story. You showed Jim Corbett's book, right? OK, my mother's uncle, uh, my great uncle, was Kumudna Chaudhuri. He was uh, Jim Corbett's friend. He shot, uh, shot tigers in the Shundarwan. And he only shot on foot because he thought it was not, just as you were saying, just as you were saying. And he only shot man eaters, okay? And so he would shoot on foot. So when he was 72, he went to shoot. He was uh, deaf in his right, uh, left ear. And uh, he shot the, the, the tiger on foot. But the tigress came back, came, came biography, it came back, it came from the back, hit him with, uh, uh, hit him with her thing, her thaba, whatever it's called, what's this, paw. Uh, hit him with her paw, killed him, okay? And so I never saw him. But this now, I'm not going to go into the gender story, okay? They had this, I mean, this is, you know, these, they were, they were, they had money. They had this unbelievable house with Belgian glass and this and that, number two Bright Street in Calcutta, okay? And you can still see it through the corner if you ever go to Calcutta. You should take a look at it. 
In the lobby of this building, my great aunt had stuffed the tiger that killed him. You understand? I mean, a huge Royal Bengal tiger, okay, the tigress, you know, with its, you know, et, et cetera. What was the politics? What was the biographical politics of that story? You know, as you were talking, I was thinking of that wonderful tiger in the lobby of Kumud Dadun's house, my goodness. Excuse me for telling this story, but it does relate. So anyway, the, and the thing is what we also learned, uh, Kathy, was to, we were told because we came, uh, I, we belonged to a very politically active, that's why I talk about Baligand, a very politically active, committed, totally left-leaning, Father Gandhi and mother uh, with the Shantrashbadis, the terrorists. Uh, you know, you can't call them terrorists in contemporary English. But at any rate, so therefore, we learned that we should also uh, un try to understand a phrase like Sardarya, the biggest river, right? The, the, the Shindu, the, the tributaries, Darya, that word, you know, the, the, that, that is water. So we should understand it as water and in the local uh, parlance, right? So it seems to me that this is something that we should also think about. This is why I said to Sangam that the word, the word superstition, it's a wonderful word. She's got a wonderful idea there. But it's a romance European word. What about how in the world's wealth of languages? Really, this is a very serious thing. This is why I remain in comparative literature, and I hope in some way before I die to, I mean, this is what I was writing this morning, uh, to make people think that a new comparative literature can collectively think about uh, langu subaltern languages, and the namic languages. And in fact, I've just started something there about uh, the great difference, the huge difference between the so-called literate and the namic. And I don't know if, Sean, you're not here, are you? Uh, then I would let him speak. I have started a, um, a, a thing just in, a couple of days ago, uh, a project which I can talk about later. It's with um, someone called Oluwaseun Akinfenwa. But uh, this is something that you really have to think about as to the incredible, incredible cutoff of those kinds of productive memories and et cetera. I'm not romanticizing the African cultures because it didn't happen. What I'm talking about didn't happen just as Marx's uh, socialist project didn't happen. Always epistemic problems. And so, and it wasn't just outside problems either. And I would like to say, Thangam, that we might perhaps think about the contingent, you know, the contingent rather than the necessary, you know, because superstition is, as you say, it's a difficult thing to simply prescribe f across, the, across the board, if you're really working across the board. It's a difficult thing, because it, first of all, superstition is so fantastically gendered that it's hard to talk about. So, and, and I would say to you, Nasrat, that uh, your uh, paper, which you yourself thought when you gave it to us, might not perhaps speak directly to, uh, to uh, climate change, climate disaster, but what it does tell us, and what your point tells us, which is why I really support that point very much, is what the uh, Bolivian thinker Zavaleta calls motley societies, that Post-colonial societies are motley societies. And Marx himself has this idea in his idea of uneven and combined. All through the Grundrisse, you will find he's worrying about what it means that he's thinking imperialism, what it means that the world is uneven in this sense, motley. And what Zavaleta says is that the motley each motley um, social formation has its own originary thinking so that it will think globality, and that's what the point you're making. It will think, and you know, I don't believe you know uh, the, my essay called Responsibility. 
do you, in 1992, when I was very, I was very happy, I'm, I'm Indian, I was chosen as a spokesperson for Bangladesh. And so <laughs> I went to the European Parliament to, because there was a thing, Telkom for the, what do you call it, the uh, uh, Green Party person, right? You see, and we spoke against Mitterrand and the bridges and so on. And so I felt a great deal of sympathy with you, but what we didn't recognize at that time, because we were not being global, we were just thinking of the of the um, of the um, of Bangladesh. That this idea of zavaletas, that they are all capable of thinking the global, but differently, and we should be able to access this. Okay, so to an extent, I would say that that's what your paper does. It takes us one step behind, and that imagining otherwise. I mean, I am so desperately bored when people say, Indian, I'm Indian. You're Indian like I'm an astrophysicist. You see, the, it, the, these, these, these single words to describe places, they show nothing but your ignorance. You know, believe me. It's, and so therefore, this idea of being able to describe cultures even, we are having a little Indian cultural festival on the streets eating curry. And so this, this idea of taking the diasporic in Euro-US cities, and th that is the opposite, Raymond Williams, the dominant taking opposition and turning it into alternative. And having them celebrate their cultures, yes, let them celebrate, I think it's a wonderful thing. But, uh, but the thing is, but let them also eat cake. But the, th the, thing is that, the thing is that, not just curry, so the thing is that we have to think about the fact that this motley, that the climate change really, if we are serious, invites us, and I believe I heard you speak to that. I, I heard Nainika really speak to that. Okay, and so I would say that this is what I found in, in uh, Nasrat's paper, that take a step back. It's okay, okay. Now, how, how far, how long have I taken? I'm not really looking. There's a clock. Uh, okay, five more minutes. Okay. So, well, cut me off because I can go forever. Uh, you know, when you're close to death, you don't want to shut up. That's, that's, that's really what it, what it is. I'm 80 with a serious spinal disease. I'll not be here long. So, you know, anyway. So, the, you know, and in terms of what you were saying, novels, the, you know, that there are not good novels. I just want to put in one, one novel here, you know. Well, how about the novel out of which Riti Ghatak made uh, Titash is uh, uh, the name of a river? It was written by a Malo, and it, the whole, the whole film is in so-called Malo dialect. That ain't a dialect, I'm a language person, but uh, you know, I have to uh, say the other points that came to my head. That and so therefore, I mean, the reason why I know Thangam really is because she wrote that fantastic uh, piece called, uh, called, what was it called, the sea piece? The Rise of the Sea in the novel. Rise of the Sea in the novel. And that's how, why this semester I taught Marguerite Duras's book, uh, the, the book uh, Barriers, Barriers Against the Atlantic, right? So, which is stupidly translated, the seawall. Believe me, the barriers against the, the Pacific, that's a very different title from the seawall, right? And that entire translation, you see most of my students are very much affected by English language racism. They can say, talk about English, global English, just in terms of their own mother tongues, but most of them think God wrote in English, okay? They only read, this is the worst monolingual country I've seen in spite of all these, these, uh, the, um, these uh, remarks about bilingualism, etc. You want to rise, you, you are not being bilingual. And Spanish has now become something like English. You on a, a bank will say, punch seven, if you want to hear, if you want to hear this in Spanish, so that particular, uh, that particular kind. Of, I'm not uh, equating white supremacists and uh, Latinx. No way. But this is a very small point, and I'm talking about English language racism. That isn't like people uh, who are in the Ku Klux Klan. But nonetheless, this so kills even from French. This book, the translation is 
deplorable. And I don't have the time, but on that thing, there is a, a longish paragraph that I wrote this morning about what uh, the sea uh, is doing in that novel. Well, I hope you'll read it, because it's the preface to the uh, 20th anniversary edition of, the, of Death of a Discipline. So I have to finish it by tomorrow, otherwise it won't be printed. So Columbia is bringing out another edition. And so the way in which in novels one can present tabulation of humans by, uh, by these um, uh, huge climatic items. You know, the Pacific, as you can see from that novel, is misnamed because it's biting the, 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 because she wrote in 1950 before all of this political correctness. It's biting the land just as she, completely strange, not really a human character at all, is building, knowing even the peasants know that the sea will eat it up. So this kind of thing, you know, to imagine the place differently. And Titash, that novel, you know, we don't, we don't know really what that novel is doing. So there again, your way of reading. So let me end. Okay, there's meant much more I have to say, but you don't, I don't like the, uh, the sound of my voice. Uh, the, um, let me end. You see, this, uh, the, the idea of the, of the contingent. See, I was teaching a, uh, a seminar with a mathematician a uh, couple years ago, and you know, he, he was a wonderful guy, very politically correct, but he was completely threatened by the things I was saying about what humanities do, you know, like suspending judgment. So, no, mathematics can never say, so, yeah, I know, I'm not asking you to suspend judgment. I'm just talking about the humanities. Mathematics ain't the humanities. This is an interdisciplinary class. So the thing is, you know, so it, it's amazing how it is. I was teaching in the law school as a university professor. I can teach everywhere. And I had been asked to teach uh, in a thing called multiculturalism. I realized once I began teaching that I was, in fact, the ethnocultural agenda, OK? So one day, the guy is talking about uh, Kant. I, you can see that he's only read Kant in English. And you can also see that he's only read a few political essays. You can see he's a lawyer. He doesn't have to read everything. And he doesn't have to read in, in German. So I'm saying, you know, I'm the co-teacher, right? So I'm saying, when we have a moment, I would really like to talk to you about the status of that word maxim. You know what he says? In class, in public, you are distracting us. I must say, the students in that class were good enough that they put up their hands and said, we want to hear Professor Spivak. You are distracting us. Nice white guy, totally, totally, my colleague. Totally, he had requested me to go teach with him. Totally politically correct. He would save the world. But nonetheless, you see, this, this is a problem that happens all the time. So anyway, I'm, uh, I said I was going to end, so I should actually make my point. I, I won't make that point. I'll, make, I'll say something about Robindranath, and I'll finish. No, contingency, I think I one should talk about. So this mathemat mathematics guy brought one day a very fine, young um, British mathematician, very famous, whose name is something like Buzzard. I now forget. Ken Buzzard is something like this. And I said that the thing that really I can contribute is contingency. Because even the most complicated uh, program, which has thought about every possible difference that can happen, every possible exception, there will be, the contingent will escape it. It won't be able to. Mathematics can't catch the contingent. He was so excited, and then my guy also, so, when he saw Ken Buzzard getting, that's not his real name, but close enough, uh, the, uh, getting excited by that thought, he also got very excited, immediately mathematized it. But anyway, I will say to you, Thangam, that the contingent rather than the necessary is a category which is a little bit uh, unlike uh, the charge of uh, the, you know, it has to be extra moral, superstitious has to be ausa moralish. So in that sense, uh, you have to, a contingent can do it, and Wittgenstein 
you know, in one of his, uh, one of his uh, late notes says that the, no image can tell you anything. Language, of course, uh, uh, we can't get into it. And then it, he says, the, 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 and even if it did, I, we can't talk about the fact that the German word Vorstellung can't be translated. That's too bad. Wittgenstein uses that word. Image is the English translation's bad, bad translation. But let's just say that nothing, it can't, uh, it can't uh, communicate anything. He says, because at the end, it cannot surprise you. See, that's the contingent. And he writes, which uh, the English mistranslates, he said, you don't, you won't see it and say, Zihada! Wow, wonderful, he writes, you know, quote, Zihada, exclamation point. Look at that, look at that. I'm surprised. You see, that, uh, that's the literary. That's the literary. When people say, how do you want the future poems, poetry to be like? Say, I don't know. I'm always surprised by the new in the literary. So to an extent, I would uh, offer you this to think about for your superstitious. And um, the thing about Rubinonat that I was going to say is a quote from his piece called Nari, or Woman. It's not been properly translated, perhaps not even really translated yet. It's in a book called Kalantar, which is something like a revolution. And it's really a bad piece. I mean, the young man, also Bengali, so he wasn't like being a white supremacist, with whom I was actually translating it, asked me, do you think he was actually tripping on weed when he, when he wrote this? It was written as a, 1936, written as an address to a very activist group of women, okay? And so there he writes that women are, of course, natural, etc., etc. Civilization is all male, okay? For hundreds and hundreds, centuries, eons, thousands and thousands of years, the light of the sun had come into the, I think I told you this, had come into these wonderful for, forests, and all of that light of the sun was held for men in these uh, pieces of wood and forests and so on as they, were, as they changed themselves. And then suddenly what came out was koila, fossil fuel, and modernity, what we can call modernity, began in the hands of men. You have to fight this one. This is not a corporatist, this is a good guy. You know, you say this to Bengalis, they will kill me, because he knew everything, and he was everyone's gurudev. But the, not mine. I mean, I think he was brilliant, but anyway. So therefore, I want to end there, uh, saying, uh, just summarizing, must rethink the academy, must rethink English language racism, must think about how on earth we can address, uh, we can be at all effective, in the face one, on the one side of the development lobby, which thinks the world's wealth of languages is an inconvenience, and on the other side with the naming language folks who are worst hit. Roz and I have just begun a thing where you record uh, television, social media, etc. programs, occasionally they come out, that, are, that really are comprehensible to the subaltern group whom you know. And then what you do is you record that bit and then you have a whole project where it can be immediately subtitled in a subaltern language. Even the person who doesn't, who cannot read, can hear from the person who can read. That's just a very minor project that I'm uh, talking about, but it really does try to go a, a little in a minor practical way to go out of the academy and out of our class, out of our confinements, out of English language racism. So thank you very much. Sorry for talking too much, but remember, I'm close to death. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all uh, for a rather long but incredibly rich and stimulating afternoon.